Alright, so, hi guys, I'm Cam. Uh, and Andrew on that side, me and Nicole. For our SBL, we investigated a uh, polyethylene plant. So, uh, we won't go any through, through any of the economics or sizing today. I'm sure you guys all know how to use the dominoes table by now. Um, so, we're going to just look at uh, the safety um, around operating this, uh, this polyethylene reactor. So, I'll take you through the process quickly now and then we'll get into some hands-on stuff. We start with a uh, uh, P, um, it's just monoethylene cut with some benzene, some hydrogen. That's just uh, at atmospheric temperature and pressure. We send it through an initial compressor. Uh, that gets it to about uh, 1500 bar. We then heat it up with our recycle stream because we do get some pressure loss that I'll talk about in a second. And that gets uh, fully compressed uh, to our operating conditions of uh, 2000 bar. Right before it enters uh, the reactor, this is all the reactor here. It's just a fun flow reactor. Um, we add our initiator and at that temperature and uh, pressure, you get degradation of the initiator and it starts the isothermic reaction. Um, once leaving the reactor, the uh, polyethylene unreacted monomer gets through a, a heat exchanger just to cool the product down so you get no more polymerization. And then it's fed to a separation vessel, which is essentially a tank where the solid polyethylene falls to the bottom and the unreacted monomer gets uh, recycled back. Now you do get a, a large pressure drop across that uh, fermentation vessel, so that's why you send it back to the secondary compressor with the feed, just to ensure everything's at the same uh, operating conditions. So, uh, to ensure uh, reproducible grade of our polymer and safety of our equipment, uh, it's important to have uh, adequate control of the system. We're all working at like very high pressures, high flow rates, and higher than mild temperatures. Um, so yeah, just to ensure that uh, our product grade remains intact and that we ensure safety of our workers and, uh, and our plant, we need to have adequate control around this reactor because it is such a, an exothermic reaction that if anything does go wrong and you get some cascading out of control, things can go bad really fast. Uh, so the rest of our presentation will just be doing a, a hazard overview of our reactor itself. And uh, you don't have to worry about writing anything down, but we'll ask for your input um, for, for implementation of, of safety for different scenarios because uh, you want to make sure that this process is, is fully safe before we start operating this. So let Dan take over now. All right, so this is a process flow diagram we found online. So uh, we kind of picked it because we thought, just looking at it right away, that it was lacking some safety measures. <laughs> so uh, we're kind of going to go through uh, our interactive portion of the presentation as we go. So we're kind of merging the two, just so you guys are aware. And uh, the scenario, or actually just to say that, this is the same reactor that was shown in the other slide, but we just compressed all the uh, water streams into one for simplicity's sake. So uh, we're gonna go through all our different hazards, and for the high pressure and reverse flow, you guys are gonna give us your feedback on what safeguards uh, we think, or you guys think we should implement, and then we'll show you what we came up with. So um, the scenario is that uh, we just had a contractor install uh, our plant and going through all the safety features, we determined that it's lacking safety on the reactor. So you guys are the engineering team and we'll be kind of like management and you guys are gonna get, we're gonna do a hazard up and you guys give us your feedback. Next slide. So the first uh, guide word is low for temperature. And what we did is the two changes we made. Uh, and the, so the causes of low temperature could be fouling in our feed, um, transmitter or control failures in both the feed and the cooling water. Consequence of this is basically lower uh, production from decreased rate of reaction, decreased uh, overall conversion. So the safeguards we implemented where we adjusted the uh, cooling water control to be on the inlet of the cooling water so that we have uh, more speedy and accurate control based on the temperature of the reactor. And secondly, we adjusted the feed control, so that's based off the temperature of the uh, reactor as well. Slide. All right, so we also did high temperature. So causes of this could be failure of the control valves going for the cooling water and the feed. Uh, there's also different changes in the ambient conditions. Um, we have we could have a blocked outlet to our reactor, causing a pressure buildup that would cause the temperature to increase. And because it's an exothermic reaction, we do have the chance of runaway reactions causing hot spots within the reactor. 
So our consequences with the reactor temperature increasing would be a possibility of a fire, the product conversion would be altered so it's no, no longer within our specified range. We also do have the fouling due to the hot spots. And we also have a reactor trip that's attached to the reactor, and if this goes off, it shuts down the entire system without knowing. And due to the in increased pressure, we could actually rupture the reactor. So in order to counteract these causes, we installed temperature controls that are attached to valves. There's also alarms as well, so that we can decrease the feed going in and increase the cooling water so that we can bring the temperature back to equilibrium. Uh, we did install a flame sensor that's attached to the sprinkler so that if we do have a fire, we can counteract that. We do have a trip alarm so that if we, if the trip sensor is, um, it does go off, we do know that our system has shut down so that we can change things. So we also increased the by or added a bypass so that we can avoid the block at the end of the reactor. So again, the guidelines are low and high, and I'm going to talk to you guys about pressure deviation. So first we have low pressure, and some causes of low pressure are failure in the pump, uh, pipe leakages, and fouling. So these in turn can cause a pressure gradient to decrease in the system, and this will cause the flow in the system to decrease, and ultimately will decrease our yield. So some things we thought of, uh, some safeguards we thought of to prevent low pressure are to install a low pressure alarm, to install a pressure control valve to control the flow in and out of the system. In addition, we wanted to install a backup pump, which you see here in red, to increase the reliability of the system. So now I'm going to talk to you about the high pressure scenario. Um, so just try and pay close attention to the causes and think of the safeguards that you would implement. So the causes, uh, since the system is so exothermic, when the temperature increases, the rate of reaction also increases, which in turn will increase the pressure. So a lot of the causes are the same as what we were describing for the high temperature scenario. I'll just go through them again so that you can recall them. So some causes are a faulty release valve, a failure of the flow valve, so a block outlet, as well as loss of the utility, so loss of cooling water will cause uh, pressure to increase, runaway reactions, uh, the system being exposed to a fire, as well as equipment failures and instrument instrumentation malfunctions. So all of these causes, all of these will cause pressure to build up in the tubes, which will cause the tubes to break. Mm -hmm. uh, high pressure also causes the system to violently vibrate, which can in turn cause a lot, a lot of containment. So now can you guys tell me some of the safeguards that you implement to the system uh, to prevent high pressure? Uh, you put a first diaphragm before your safety relief valve to stop the corrosion of the valve. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs>
So we would have less total product yield, which is not what you wanted this at all. You minimize your profits and your uh, money made. And also, if you decrease the uh, fee to a certain point, it, could, it is possible that you could uh, not be supplying enough transformer energy to sustain this reaction. In this case, the reaction would shut down, and then you would have to start it up all over again. So to safeguard against this, we installed a low pressure alarm around our control and also uh, a process system for the flow control to adjust the flow valve, uh, to adjust the flow control. And uh, also it would have uh, control over the pumps to be able to apply more duty to increase the uh, flow rate from the system if it falls too low. Uh, next slide. Uh, for high flow rate, this would be caused by either maybe both our service and uh, standard pump are in operation, and so this would create uh, an increase in the flow rate if both are running at the same time, or just an increased duty by one of the pumps applying too much power. Uh, the consequences for this from an increase in feed to the reactor would be uh, from the ideal gas lock, we have an increase in volume, and that would also increase the pressure in the reactor itself, and it could cause uh, the reactor to burst or damage. Um, also, the increase in pressure could cause the reactor to vibrate, which would put mechanical stresses on the reactor itself, and you get to damage the entire process. And uh, if you do all this, you also have, if you have higher flow rate, you also increase the stress on the subject stream, which means we're going to have to have all of our other operations functioning at higher uh, operability. And to safeguard this, we, ha we already have the bypass stream uh, within implemented, so if uh, the, the flow is too high, uh, some of the flow can be diverted around. Uh, also, we installed a high flow alarm, which again will adjust the flow rate from the flow control and also the duty supplied by the pumps. Uh, for the special case, we're going to do reverse flow. Um, causes of this will be uh, pump failure or a uh, failure from the flow valve or even changes in ambient conditions around the reactor itself. Consequences from a, a reverse flow would be uh, the reactor itself can start reacting, and again, it's just caused through any other startup, which would be costly. Uh, decrease in product yield, or it can just back up in other parts of our process, which would cause an overall uh, big mess for our company. So, I'm wondering if you guys have any ideas of first how we could monitor to see if we're experiencing a reverse flow in the system, and then how do we safeguard against that? If anyone's had, had any, any ideas. I want to take like, like a minute and discuss yeah. with the person next to you, and maybe come up. Uh, yeah. Try and think about how you monitor to see if there is reversal of current system, but then if that is happening, how would you prevent that for Yeah, 
process of our catalyst. Essentially, the regeneration process is our largest constraint on formalin production. So we've designed our process and our reactors expecting that expecting a three-year life expectancy out of our catalyst. But to maintain efficiency and quality of our product, we decided to send our process through a regeneration cycle every year and a half. So I'm going to give you a bit of a breakdown of what that's going to look what that is going to look like. What we're going to do is essentially shut off the methanol and oxygen inlet into our reactor, and from there we're going to pump in a cesium solution into the reactor, which flushes out the catalyst bed. Um, from there, that solution is sent to waste, and for the remainder of the process, um, we'll just let every we're going to let every single unit uh, go offline and send it through any maintenance protocols that might be necessary if uh, there's something that's broken down. Um, so, based on the, that basic assumption, we decided that we need a, vol a two me cubic meter volume of silver catalyst, along with that at a density of around 10,500 meters cubed. And so, yeah, that's a general breakdown of what the generation of the catalyst is like and how it's going to get into the economics of it. Okay, so obviously if we're taking the entire plant offline, it's going to cause some reduction losses. We're planning for two shutdowns in a three year period, and each shutdown is going to last one to two weeks, depending on what exactly needs to be done during that period. Um, we're planning a full maintenance uh, during each shutdown, and as you can see the maintenance cost we've listed here is $160,000 every shutdown period, and into that we've factored the um, like testing of equipment, uh, cleaning of equipment, and a lot of times uh, we might even have to replace equipment. Uh, I know for for example, some pieces of equipment that's very common throughout our process, just a simple valve can cost up to $5,000 and sometimes only last a year. Um, that really depends on what's going through it, but uh, we don't expect to have, uh, we don't expect to have it that bad, but we do expect to be replacing some of them, especially heat exchangers need to be replaced and those are very costly, but uh, more often we'll probably just be able to clean those. Um, replacing the silver, again, the silver is the biggest constraint on our, our whole process here and the amount of silver required is going to cost us about $10 million. We only have to actually replace it once every three years and then uh, these the first shutdown is just going to be the regeneration where we flush it with the cesium salts, and that is not very costly at all. Um, but the the silver here is based on one of the lowest quotes we found for silver, which is about five hundred dollars per kilogram, uh, adding up to the total you see here. So we're going to go into a class activity now. Yeah, um, we have a really quick class activity. Um, just a Hazoff analysis on the level in the separator. Uh, our actual has up in our report is going to focus on the, uh, you want to drop the table real quick. Um, um, yeah, uh, our actual report is going to focus on the reactor has off, but uh, we want to focus on the separator. So we chose three really quick guide words because we weren't really sure how long this would take because I'm sure people like to speak up. But, um, we have the three really quick guide words and our deviations. So we had high, low, and none. And was going to write on the board. And then we had uh, the level of the separator is too high, level of the separator is too low, or there is no link in the separator. And the question we're going to ask you guys is go back to the quick thing. Uh, what could cause this? Anybody? Anyway, for, for any of them. For any it doesn't of them. have what to be like the order, don't worry yeah. about that at all. Yeah, Derek, yeah. <laughs> too much flow into the unit? Too much flow into the unit. Perfect. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, can you go back to the process now? Right. So, <coughs> level down here. What can cause too much flow into the unit? I was just going to say like one thousand feet clock. One thousand feet clock, perfect. And that's high or low? High. High. Like high in the tank. Okay, so which valve do you go? Um, oh. That one, perfect. So the bottom valve. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what could cause uh, the valve? Or what's the? Square one. Can go back to this one? Um. What is the consequences of too much flow into the separator? Overflow. Overflow. Um, of your valve. Overflow. Perfect. Overflow of the uh, vessel. Thank you. Appreciate that. And uh, what's another consequence? 
How does it separate the vessel? Is it heated? Or? Uh, yeah, it's pretty much a distillation. Pretend it's a distillation. So yeah, that just here. It's got a reboiler down here and a condenser up here, and uh, it's flare heated, so it separates the two. Um, it's actually the condenser down here keeps this really cool form formaldehyde in the water. But yeah, it's just for catalog. So uh, what's another purity? Perfect. That's perfect. Purity. Um, all right. So what can cause low flow? Damn. Blockage in the upper valve. Perfect. And what is a consequence of low flow? The low level. Or yeah, low level. Sorry, thing.
you have that situation where uh, no maintenance is done on the plant, so in that case, it is known that the plant will be able to operate for at least one year. So we assume that one uh, critical piece of equipment, like the ozone generator, will fail uh, once in a year. So uh, the, um, the reliability comes to the plane, and uh, the number of outcomes is five, and that includes lot of sales, storage, or processing of the water in the plant.
Where does that material go? The drain? Yeah. The drain goes into a, a municipal sewage system. Yeah. They don't reuse that water. And yeah, so this goes into our workshop. So our workshop is going to be a hazard analysis on the outlet pipe of the metal unit. Uh, the intention of the outlet pipe is to deliver partially purified water to the ozone contactors for disinfection. The deviation is going to be a uh, turbidity level that's too high, so it won't adequately disinfect the water. A cause of this or could be that uh, the polymer and fresh micro sand uh, inlet isn't enough to uh, adequately flocculate the particulate matter in the three mixing tanks. The consequences of this will be that the uh, water going to the ozone contractor will not be uh, adequately purified and will be really safe to drink. So, does anybody have like a solution or like any kind of idea of what they would do to reduce the turbidity from the other concentration? Knowing that the polymer and sand are related to how much particulate matter is the
What's the time delay between making an increase in the level of compensation before you actually see the change in the distribution tank load to you? Roughly. Before it's put into the active flow system, they have a nice little time of 30 to 40 minutes, depending on the season. Um, I'm not sure of the time delay. Yeah, because obviously with the uh, process control, we know that time delay and long residence time are the two things that really kill us. I mean, we have to really reach in on control of the system. So I'm just curious what that is. How much does one of these pumps cost? I mean, 97 megaliters is a pretty massive flow rate. Like, how much does that cost? That's still a massive flow rate over a day. Yeah, we didn't need it. Since our scope was mainly for the sedimentation tank, we didn't look into pricing for that. Okay. But, like, you know. <laughs> that is amazing. It's pretty 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 amazing. So it's the last time. 